Hello and welcome back to the What The Fork Sunderland preview podcast in association with Viper Goalkeeping. As you can probably tell from the title, today's preview show is an extra special playoff preview show and we'll be chatting to a representative from each club within the League One playoffs to see who is confident and who kind of isn't. But in no particular order, we've got a first returning guest. We've got Tom, Times Digital Sports Editor and of course, Lincoln City fan. Tom, how are we doing? Are you all right? I'm not too bad, Graham. Not too bad. Uh, I, I can't quite work out how I feel about the playoffs, but uh, by the end of this show, maybe I'll maybe I'll feel a bit clearer, certainly about who's going to win it. Not Lincoln, that's for sure. Well, definitely not Sunderland either, mate. So um, <laughs> I hope that bites me on the arse, though, and I hope I'm wrong. But there you go. Um, another returning guest making his hat, Rick, believe it or not. Sai. Um, I was going to say you're pleased to see me, but after our last game between each other, I think that might be a no, mate. So how are you doing aside from that? I'm, I'm very well, yeah. Quite a lively game that was, wasn't it? Yes. Plenty to talk about there. <laughs> if, if we had a if we had a tunnel side, I think we'd have a skirmish midway through this podcast <laughs> just to kind of commemorate it. Um, and we've got a debutant, Matt from uh, Mitch Cook's left foot. I need to Google who Mitch Cook is. But I'm obscure nineties footballer, I just believe. But but Matt, how are you doing? Are you all right? I'm all good, mate. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, he's a cult hero at Blackpool and Scarborough, so you know, real top level footballer. Very much sounds like a regen. Yeah, the Chapman region, one hundred percent. No, he's 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 one hundred percent physically real. Good. Um, I think I'll start off with you first, side because you're the, the nearest one to me on my screen, which people can't see. So that's the point of saying that. It's often been said that the team that sneaks into the playoffs, not that you did that, but you were the last to arrive in it, um, can go on to win the thing. You've got the best form in terms of the last six games. You're top of the league in the, in the form table. Um, you got the final last year. You actually finished higher in the league. So, as an Oxford fan, how how confident is the fan base based around the playoffs? Uh, I think like every fan who gets in or any any team that gets in the playoffs, there's always that kind of nervousness. I've I've been looking at teams that have got in one year and lost in the final and how they've done the following year. And it's We're a mixture shitting of, ourselves, aren't we? We're all we shitting are. ourselves. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like. There's no point in it. form goes out the window, all of that sort of stuff. Um, the only thing I think that ben, will benefit us over last year was there was a good sort of two months between the last game of the the regular season when we everybody stopped playing and when the playoffs started. So we've only had about a ten day break this time, and I think that will benefit us. But like it, it's it is a lottery, isn't it? It really is. Um, not not confident, but not unconfident. I know that sounds like a stupid thing to say, but I. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll have I'll have a better idea after Tuesday night of how we're coping with it as fans and and as players. There's a huge part of me at the start of the season because obviously we played your second game of the season and it's on record that I said I think Oxford are going to win the league, and then you lost like six in a row or something. I was like, oh, how stupid am I? And then like you sneaked into the playoffs, and I was like, oh, ha, Portsmouth didn't get in this year. Oh, hang on, I tipped Oxford to get from. Oh, hang on, something. Oh, no, 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 because I personally think Oxford will win it because of Carl Robinson, basically, um, fighting with our players in the tunnel. I feel like it's football's very cyclical, isn't it? So my pessimism um, is based around that, but I think we're all the same. We're crapping ourselves a little bit. Um, before I go to you, Tom, um, really, really quickly, say, how much will the absence of Carl Robinson actually affect the team, do you think? Interestingly, the, the game. So he got the red card up at right, at um, at your place. The following, the game after that, where he was had a touchline ban, we won six nil. He then started the first of his four game touchline ban, the last game of the season, which we won four nil. So two games, ten goals. I think the players quite like the fact that he's sat up in the stand and, and can't have a go at them. <laughs> that you know, it, it and he's got a four match ban, so it will be the two playoff semi finals and then either the first game of next season or potentially the playoff final. So we've done all right with him sat in the stands. But like, obviously, we fell off a cliff since then. So it's like it's very typical someone to have a fight and give it the big one and then do what we did um, I think as fans we, we looked at after that game I think most of our yeah. fans thought we've got no no chance of getting in and it was a, it was a sort of a, a funny thing it was kind of like I tell you what, we'll make the, we'll make the playoff final we'll play Sunderland and we'll win and Carl Robinson will do a knee slide at max power it will be sort of like a, a nice full circle on it I mean no I don't think anyone thought it was going to happen but it's it's closer to happening now than we thought there's, there's a big part of me that thinks that but that's 
Graham's pessimistic mind, as I said off the record before, I've been thinking, well, hang on, Lincoln have played us three times and not one. We beat them in one semi final. Oh, Lincoln's going to want revenge. Then I'm thinking, well, Black will have a good playoff. And then I'm thinking, oh, Oxford want to get their own back on us and stuff like that. The weird situation could be with Oxford is that if we both get to the final, then which end is Stuart Donald and Charlie Meffin going to be sitting in this time? Um, I hope not the Sunderland end. You can have them. Um, Tom, I'll come to you. Um, very popular guest last time, by the way, Tom. Welcome back. People liked you an awful lot. So obviously, no pressure. No pressure, no pressure at all. Yeah, everyone's like, oh, great. Be- best guest of the year. No offense, Si. Um, <laughs> None taken. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Lincoln were like punching probably above their weight for a long time and, and kind of sitting in automatic. And then when you started going, oh, hang on, Lincoln actually might do something, then you kind of dropped. There's, there's, there's reasons for that. There's a lot of reasons for that. I think an injury and things that happen in football do go into it. But then he came back into form and there was a point at halftime at Peterborough, sorry to mention it, when I thought, hang on a minute, are Peterborough going to do Peterborough and are Lincoln going to sneak in out of nowhere? Um, and then you dipped a little bit again. You, you finished in um, finished in fifth, but you're in fairly good form, uh, better than us, I suppose. Um, is there a genuine feeling Lincoln can win the playoffs and have championship football come August? Oh. It's such a strange one. Si touched on it before, and I think for all Lincoln fans, it's good to buy into the this is a mini season, it's it's all starts again type feeling. That's that's what will suit Lincoln fans and Lincoln players, I think, really well. As you say, we were punching way above our weight, and then all of a sudden the expectation hit at the same time as a lot of injuries hit, and we had a disastrous march. But And there was lots of fans who were even thinking that we wouldn't make the playoffs. And so to have done so... And uh, don't want to dwell on Peterborough and Sammy Smodic's dive and in oh my god that refereeing decision. But uh, oh my god, I think I think to uh, to break it down and go, we've, we're in the playoffs. That is still punching above our weight a little bit, and so we can adopt the outsiders tag, the underdogs tag. You know, Oxford expected to be there from last season. Blackpool. Great squad assembled, got a great goal scorer. You guys have got all the experience. We'll just sneak in as the underdogs, I think, and go in under the radar. And that that that'll suit Lincoln. And I think that's how a lot of fans are feeling. And I think Michael Appleton will be trying to instill that into his players a little bit because I think that will suit us, particularly being a young squad, to be underdogs um, and to be the one no one's expecting to win it. That'll suit us down to the ground, I think. I know you've got nothing massively against him, I don't think. Um, but was it quite Kind of funny. We're seeing Danny Cowley fail on the last day and you kind of been sitting there quite comfortable. I would say Lincoln fans are split completely down the middle. Danny Cowley and his brother Nicky are almost becoming a bit Marmite for Lincoln fans. Some feel very strongly against him and how it all panned out with him leaving for Huddersfield. Others, like myself, will always just have admiration for what he did, what he achieved in such a short space of time. Um, I was actually very shocked that they didn't get in the playoffs. They had the initial bounce um, and I was I was fully convinced. I actually wrote an article saying that I was convinced they were gonna they were gonna get in at, uh, at our expense. Actually, so I was very very surprised. Um, but no, I, w- I wasn't I wasn't gleefully uh, enjoying enjoying their demise and dropping out as much as uh, I did actually predict that Oxford would make it. So I was pleased in that respect. So thanks, Sai, for uh, for uh, making me look good. People will disagree with me on this, probably, because um, everyone's got an opinion and football is a game of that. Um, but it feels like Blackpool are probably the favourites for the playoffs and have some real momentum. Obviously, I've seen a few of the scenes with the fans and, and the manager and with the things that have happened with Blackpool, which I won't labour on, it feels like Blackpool are actually a legitimate functioning football club again. But I don't think I'd like to go into any competition as favourites, but that might just be my mindset. Um, is the tag of favourites something that Blackpool fans are relishing? Um, I don't know if we see ourselves as favourites, but I think there is a quiet confidence because unlike most of our decent teams in the last 30 years, we're actually built on a really, really solid defence and midfield. Um, and there's that sense that even when we don't play well, we cannot lose, which is quite useful. Um, and we're really not used to that. You know, normally when we're any good, we're, you know, obviously Holloway being the sort of the, the pinnacle of that. We, we need to be on our game to get results because it's about, it's about scoring one more goal than the other team. But we're not like that now. Um, yeah, confidence is... In, 
uh, the team that scare me most is is probably Lincoln because they're the team that I think everybody would think that we should beat. Uh, you know, if if Oxford are a, a really good side, I think everybody has rated Oxford for a couple of years as a football team. Sunderland are Sunderland. You've got the reputation. You've got McGeady, who frankly terrifies me because when he clicks, he's out of this world. I know he doesn't click every every you know every game, but. Lincoln are the one that we should beat, and they're the what they're the one side in that top that that top eight that we haven't beaten. I think I think that would be right to say. And even the game we played away against Lincoln, I think that was the point Lincoln's season turned. We wiped the floor with you for seventy minutes. We we should have scored seven, eight, and then that last twenty minutes they just came back and scored twice. And you know that's that they're the team that scare me. So yeah. I don't know whether they answered the question, but that's how I feel. It's a funny one because I think, and I've been guilty of it myself with Sunderland saying, you've got to go into the playoffs with a little bit of momentum. You've got it. And, and Sunderland are on poor form. I think we've won one in 10 or something um, since we beat Oxford on that Easter, whatever, whenever Jesus came back from the dead and we celebrated it. Um, and in a way, I look back at like, our last playoff form, and I think we'd lost two or three games all season, and then we got beat off Fleetwood on the Tuesday night in a, like a game we had to catch up on, and then we got beat off South End, and South End stayed up uh, last day of the season. So we went in the playoffs losing two, and I think we drew the one before that, and we played Portsmouth who we hadn't beaten all season, and then we turned Portsmouth over and didn't concede a goal, and then we played Charlton in the final who we got the better of on the first day of the season and got a draw with, probably should have won. And then, well, everyone knows how that one worked out with Charlton. So it's a funny one, isn't it, when we talk about favourites and we talk about um, form and stuff like that, because I think it doesn't re really count, does it, necessarily in a playoff? There's no, there's actually not that much evidence to say the form team or the favourites goes to win it. It can be different people every year. There's different situations every year, isn't there? Uh, absolutely. And, and, um... <sighs> We, I, the, the, I think the quiet confidence comes from the fact that we, we've struggled against, you know, any team that aren't actually very good. We've struggled against any team that's any good. I mean, Ipswich are a bit mediocre, but, the, you know, they're theoretically good. Any team that's any good, we've played really well against. Um, and that's the way our season's gone. And there aren't, you know, the playoffs, even at the beginning of the season, when we were right down near the bottom, when we played the big teams... When we played Portsmouth away uh, at home, we looked sensational. When we played, I, I don't know, Wimbledon, we looked like we weren't, you know, we looked like the most naive team in the world that we're, that we're going to get relegated. Um, and that's been the pattern all year, that even even up to the last month or so, the teams who struggled, we, the two games we lost um, on the running were against, you know, weaker sides who were going to five at the back, boot it to one man and um, we're not going to face that in the playoffs and and any side that comes at us will give them the game any side that that plays we will give them a game there's no question about that because we're very very good at that we're not very good at beating AFC Wimbledon you know that's just who we are and I think Sunderland fans will probably resonate with that a little bit we've had similar sort of issues but um I spoke to a manager of a club the other day who's um and we talked about a previous result and they said it doesn't this sort of thing doesn't exist in football where you talk about like the form at certain ground or form in previous years. You say like, it's just how you, you play on the day. But as fans, that's entirely different. You remember days and moments and stuff. And you look at Blackpool's record, the playoff record, currently most successful playoff team of all time. I think you've won, I checked out the entire record. You've won five playoff finals. You've won 16 in total. You've drew three and you've lost four since I think 1990. Um, I'm the opposite end of the spectrum with Sunderland. We haven't done anything ever in the playoffs pretty much. Um, Any Blackpool fan of my age will just immediately though tell you about Bradford in 1996, which is sort of scarred into our DNA. As well. You know, it's all that success. And we'll go straight to the Bradford game where we, we were 2-0 up away from home. Um Played him off the park and then lost three nil at home after missing out on automatic by I can't remember if it was a point or by by goal scored. So you know we we have our own playoff horrors in the back it, it, that we can remember as well. So you know, 
Uh, that's what I think. I think a playoff semi-final. I don't think of you know the game we beat Nottingham Forest, you know the famous game we beat Forest. I think of the Bradford game in the semi-final, where I stood there at the end, just as close to tears as I've ever been at a football match, just thinking how how have we not how have we not been promoted? So I think there is that that negative. That it does negative it does scar you? As well. It really does scar you. Like when I mean we. I was talking to a friend the other day about that Charlton game, and I'm sorry to the Sunderland fans listening for bringing that up. But it felt like that, it wasn't the two allegations that broke me. It wasn't getting beat off Newcastle 5-1 a few years ago that broke me. It was that Charlton game I just broke. <laughs> I just went, oh, nah, this is forever going to be desperation and horribleness. And I think as much as I didn't really enjoy the second season of Sunderland until I died, the, the girl at the end that goes, why is it always us? And it's like that kind of is ingrained. But with that kind of playoff form, well, I suppose you sort of answered it, really. Do you go back to the times when, oh, well, it hasn't always worked out, or do you actually get a bit of confidence from the fact that, like, the side has turned up sometimes? Yeah, I think, I think, I think we do get confidence from that, and I think we also, like I said in the first answer, I think we get confidence in that that we are. I mean, like every side, we're up and down. You know, we're not world beaters every week, but we are always solid. We've conceded sixteen goals since Christmas. I think the nearest to, I think we've conceded thirteen less goals than anybody else since Christmas, um, and that is. As I said at the beginning, that that's quite hard to get used to for a Blackpool fan. I've spent all season kind of going, we need more creativity, we need more goals. You know, we can't just rely on Yates to score all the goals. We're not scoring enough. And actually, here we are third, and we still we've scored a lot less goals than most of the rest of the the teams at the top. And um, and that sol- that solidity is it's systemic. It's in the way we play that they no matter who comes out for us, they they do the basics of not losing football matches very, very well. And since about November, there have been very few games. There's been games where we've been uninspired. There's been games where we've looked toothless. There's been games where we've lacked creativity. But there have been very few games where we look like we're going to ship more than one goal. Uh, Ipswich have had a hoodoo on us. That, that's about the only game I can think of since Christmas where we've been really looked like a team might take us to bits. And that gives you hope because it means that, you know, we're probably not going to have two bad games in the first leg in over the two legs. And even if we have a bad game, we should be able to keep it down to a minimum and, and be in with a chance. So I think, you know, emotionally, yeah, it does give us a bit of confidence and, and pragmatically, I think there is a reason to be confident as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree with that. Um, Sai, so moving back to sort of Oxford, talking of confidence, I think I mentioned it sort of before in, in maybe the intro. I mentioned it at some point. Um, the form table has, to put it into context, Oxford are top, Blackpool are third, Lincoln are 14th, Sunderland are 16th. Um, but it is technically a cup competition, even though we don't see it as that. How much does league form actually count in these one-off playoff games? It's difficult to know because of the, the quality of the teams you're playing. Some of them are, are mid-table; they're on the beach already. Um, mm. You know, it, it can you get the odd result at the end of a season, which isn't necessarily how, how it would be if it was played in the middle of the season. And it's it is difficult to say. I think what will help us, I kind of touched on it earlier, was the way we play. We you know we try and play nice football and and you know getting little little triangles going and, and, and sort of players used to playing with each other. And we really struggled last year because of the gap between the final league game and, and the start of the playoffs. So, but I think this time round, we'll be going in with a team that's confident and we'll try stuff. And, and hopefully we'll be able to play as well as we can in the playoffs. You know, there's not going to be that we need to get back up to speed again. Um we're certainly scoring goals, which is great. Um, but then Blackpool aren't conceding goals. So it, it, it's going to be that you almost look at certainly the first leg where we're at home. You kind of get the feeling it might be a little bit, you know, attack against defence. And, and, and it, it'll either be if we if we play well enough, we could do really well in that game or we might cancel each other out. It's a real it's I think that that first game is going to be the crucial one. I know that might sound a bit daft, but I I think if if, if Blackpool can can do a, you know shut us out I think they've got every chance in in at home obviously you know Jerry Yates scores goals if we can get ourselves ahead in that first leg I think you know it obviously it will swing towards us but it, it's going to be so tight and, and difficult the form 
yeah, we, we've played and we've won a lot of games and we've scored a lot of goals, but it's not been against top sides in this running. Um, we always felt with six or eight games to go, if we could be there or thereabouts, we, we looked at the running and it wasn't against any of the top sides. And we've not, apart from Lincoln a few weeks ago and, and Doncaster, I think they're the only teams that we were playing at the, at the time were above us that we've beaten. We've, we've struggled against the teams above us. Um, so it's, yeah, no, it, it, it's such a tight one. You know, you look at any, you could make a really good argument for any of the four teams. Oh, easy. To either win it or not, you know, it, you could. You, it, it's it's a it's absolutely impossible to call. It would be so bizarre if you did get to the final, all right, play ourselves or Lincoln. It would be the second playoff final where you've had no fans allowed. Yeah, possibly. Although, aren't we? I thought the playoff, the well, I suppose it depends what happens with who with knows? lockdowns and stuff like that. But um, we've got the Indian variant, then we'll get the Angolan <laughs> variant, then we'll get the Japanese variant. We'll just keep on getting different random variant, variants yes. that stop us from going to games. Which I suppose I was going to say has its uh, has its plus points, but then I was sitting on the computer on Friday frantically searching for tickets to see us probably get beat off Lincoln in the semi final of the playoffs. So. Um, on that, Tom, obviously, I want to ask a, a similar question, but maybe with a, a bit of a different slant. Um, as I mentioned before, our last playoff campaign, so to speak, Pompey over two legs and would fail to beat them all season and in the finals, where you could say we all went into that in bad form. We went into the games going, oh, Portsmouth, like I'm sick of playing them. I'm sick of getting beat off them. Um, it's probably fairly similar for yourselves and the fact that you've drew two, lost one on penalties of those draws, lost 4-0 at home against us, um, and then your players in the playoffs. Do you feel a bit more confident actually playing Sunderland and the fact that you've had three games and, and played against us more than the other teams, i.e. you'll know us a little bit better, you'll know our strengths, you'll know our weaknesses. Does that give you a bit more confidence than if you maybe hadn't? I don't know whether it's the number of games that give me confidence, but I do have a little bit more confidence. You know, I didn't, I didn't want Blackpool and I, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't want Oxford for the momentum factor. And so I was quite comfortable with the idea of playing you guys because I remember coming on the show previously, which was before the home league game. And I remember we were in a bad state with a few players out injured. Um, and I was fully expecting to be, you know, comfortably beaten basically by you guys and you were in great form. But we played quite well in that game, finished one all. And we played the way in which Michael Appleton wants to play, even without a lot of his best players. And I think that that gave the players confidence to, you know, a bit of a bit of a turnaround. And as Matt said, we also got the draw against Blackpool as well, which was a good confidence booster. Um, I think with having the players back, as we've now got lots of players returned from injury in the last few weeks of the season. Um, yeah, I think we the familiarity, but also that game, that league game, showing that we can play the way Appleton wants to play and get a result. Um, and banishing some of the memories of the, the Papa John semi-final and that heavy defeat at home, I think that will help. Um, that will help us going into this game definitely. It's funny we went into that game, and I remember I, I think I said, I think I said one-one. It was like the first result that I got right on the on the preview show. Um, for the record, I'm not tipping something to win the playoffs based on that form of terrible predictions. Um, but I think. It kind of surprised us in a way because we were in really good form and obviously we, were, we won a few games after that. And I think it was the week after we just won at Wembley and you came with us and you played well and it was like, oh, there's a few players there that are actually not even in their team. Like, And, and there was a little bit at that point where you kind of went, oh, is this going to be as good as we want it to be? Because we were on such good form and, and Lincoln made us maybe take a step back and then obviously things took a, a big cycle backwards after that because of various reasons. Um, but that for that... Uh, for the Lincoln fans, was that particular game the game that made you go, uh, hang on, actually, we have got a decent side. We're not just going to fall out the playoffs and have a good start of the season and then go, oh, I wish we'd kept that up. And then obviously getting the players back. Does that give you a bit more confidence going into these, not just these games, but the, the whole campaign? Yeah, definitely. I think there was, Matt Matt rightly pointed out before, the comeback against Blackpool had a massive impact on a little up, upturn in form. But yeah, that game against you guys, the informed team at the time, without a lot of players, um, getting a draw, but also playing quite well. I remember speaking to my dad afterwards and doing the usual dissection of the game that you do after watching it on iFollow and trying not to throw your laptop out the window. But we both said, oh, OK, well, maybe maybe it's not all over then. There is there's hope yet. Um, 
So, yeah, it'll be difficult. I think it's interesting the points the guys have made about defences and the playoffs, the Football League playoffs are obviously notorious for these incredible thrillers that we've had down the years and Sunderland have been part of them. But I do wonder whether we're going to see one of the tightest playoffs that we've ever had for a long, long time. You know, Blackpool's defensive record. I think I thought Oxford looked very composed when they beat us um, at their place uh, earlier this year. You guys have had good defensive periods at times. Um, and we, it's a bit of a mixed bag, basically. We've, we've ended the season shipping a few goals, but actually we had a really good run of where we won 1-0 away from home against teams lower down the table and just looked really solid and gritty. And some of the things that perhaps as a young squad we haven't shown all season. Um, so uh, any neutrals listening who might be hoping for three threes and five fives and all this kind of stuff, I half wonder whether they'll be a bit disappointed and we might have some very tight two one over two leg type, type games to come. Loads of nil nils all the way there, like and I then do, like I, loads I of missed penalties. <laughs> I do, I do half wonder. You know, I, you know, Matt's talks about Blackpool's amazing defensive record and things, and I just, I just with it, there's so much on the line. Team that'll be the that'll be the. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Does anyone think their team will go for it? I, I half wonder whether we might, just on the basis of the nothing to lose type vibe that we've got in that punching above our weight, got a very young squad, got Brennan Johnson, Morgan Rogers, you know, these young, talented kids on the wings. I wonder whether Appleton might go for it, but does anyone else think they're, you know, they'll go for it or will it be safety first? I think I with Sunderland, yeah. Yeah, I think Sunderland will because I think Johnson likes playing like that. Um, I think we've kind of got to. I think there's no point in sitting back. Sunderland's best players are the ones going forward, not going back. Mm. Um, whereas it might be slightly different for you, Matt, because of the, you haven't conceded a goal in four games. Are you going to base it based on that back well, four? I, I can't see Critchley just sort of saying, right, lads, you know, go out and play like Brazil because he, 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 well, he sort of did at the beginning of the season. It didn't work very well. Um, and then, the, I mean, Critchley's really hard to judge because we've been about four different teams this season. We were, we were kind of a, a not very good fake Liverpool for a couple of months that really didn't work very well. Then we were, uh, surprisingly, we became a very straight up and down 4-4-2 with Gary Bedeen as the key man, which we, don't think we saw that coming at the beginning of the season. Then Medine got injured and it didn't work again for a little while because we were trying to play with Medine, but he wasn't there. So that didn't really work. Um, and then really where where we clicked was the Oxford game away when we beat Oxford. That was the first time I think I'd really seen um, what I think he wants deep down, which is a solid base. I thought Oxford played quite well at, at, in the home game against us, um, but a solid base and then bang on the, uh, you know, bang counter attack. And I, I can't see us going away from that because that's, that's been broadly what's brought us success. Um, we're, we're not, we're not, ultra defensive we're just very good at breaking up play we're very we've got we've got a very good back four and we're very good at breaking up play and we're better at exploiting holes that the other team leaves than creating our own goals if that makes sense you know we, we our one weakness is we don't have a huge amount of creativity we've got we've got Sully Kai Kai who is sort of a poor man's McGeady. He's either brilliant or he's, he's, he's useless. Um, <laughs> Garbett takes a good free kick. Keshi Anderson is, he can be quite creative, but he, again, he, he might blow hot and cold and everybody else is, is quite workmanlike. Everyone else is solid. So, so yeah, I, I can't see us suddenly tearing the place up like um, Ozzy Ardilas is Tottenham or something. Ben Bolton's an interesting one, because he has given us something in that he's really split our fan base. And I think Sunderland fans are quite mixed on him as well. I've Sunderland fans I, you know, talk to on Twitter and they don't rate him at all, but he has given us something because he's, he's very canny and oh, he's actually our second highest assist maker or third high. Yeah. Third highest assist maker, even though he's only played about 12 games because he just gets about and he, he, he is, he's always looking to do something, even though he's not, brilliant 
he gives us that that little bit of difference where most of our team are very metronomic. Like Grant Ward has been wonderful for us this year. He's just he's just a metronome. He just covers every bit. He puts his foot in. He never wastes the ball. But so many of our players are like that. That when we, our problem is sometimes we'll have loads of possession, knock it around, keep possession, but then it's just it's frustrating. And Embleton has been really good at. Yes, he'll spoon it out of play sometimes. <laughs> yes, he'll hit the top tier of the stand, but he's always looking to play the forward pass. And he's he's been, but I'm not sure he's going to start. Anyway, we're getting into a few a few, a few people mentioned that with Embleton just to kind of touch on it. And I think because I'm probably more on the fence of thinking he's not very good, but then he does annoyingly have something where I'm like, ah, I see something there. And a lot of people have said, you know, worst case scenario. He's a young kid in terms of experience as a whole because of his injuries. He always plays on the front foot and not all of our players do that. Um, so I'm starting to wonder if that's the case. Just to sort of swing back to you really quickly, Tom, and I'm aware that everyone in League One thinks something fans are arrogant, whatever, don't care. But we're obviously going to have 10,000 fans um, at the Stadium of Light. And to be fair, we can be a pessimistic bunch for obvious reasons. I don't need to go into why. Um, but the buzz around the fact that we could get back into the stadium will have been felt across all the clubs because I think we can all have fans in as far as I'm aware. Um, Sunderland fans are vigorously passionate, not to say we're more passionate than anyone else, but there's more of us um, in that stadium because it's a bigger stadium. Do you think that could play a part in the second leg? Say like you don't beat us 5-0 in the first leg and it's like 1-0 or 0-0 or 1-1 and then you come to the stadium light and there's 10,000 Sunderland fans going absolutely acker for want of a better word. Do you think that could work in our favour and work against you? I think it could. I would just say, firstly, that I don't consider Sunderland fans to be arrogant. I consider you to be very pessimistic and almost terrified most of the time. It's not just you. <laughs> not just you. I've got a number of friends who are Sunderland fans and they're all like, oh, God. I think I give too much umbrage to Twitter opinions. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck Twitter. Yeah, yeah. That's a bad idea. Definitely not arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> terrified is what I'd go for. Um, it, it definitely could have, could have an impact, of course. But what I would say is that we're very good away from home and that we've got a couple of young players who... You know, Morgan Rogers is an unbelievable talent, 18 years old from the Manchester City Academy. Those, those kind of lads, he, he will love the idea of dropping the shoulder and banging one in the top corner in front of 10,000 to completely silence the place. Brendan Johnson will be the same, desperate to show what he can do. Um, he's been superb for us on loan from uh, Forest. So I, it, could, it could work the other way. I'm trying to, trying to be positive here. And, and it has the inverse effect, doesn't it, of when... Say it goes into a tight second leg and we score early. You've then got 10,000 fans who are supposed to be making the most noise you've ever heard in your life. And all of a sudden, all you can hear is, oh, crap. Oh, God, not this again. And that then has a negative effect on your team. And, it, and for us, for a young team, as I say, playing the underdog card, maybe. We're not supposed to be here. You know, these young players with great skill and ability. It, it, could, it could have the uh, opposite effect. And I know Michael Appleton said about not being that worried about it. Um, and so I think that'll be part part of his thinking, definitely. I'm just going to chip in there because he, when he was at Oxford, he lived in Tank where I live, and we went to this, we went to the same gym. And uh, I told a few people that and they said, so he was on the weights machine, you were on the vending machine, were you? That's the <laughs> but yeah, no, he, he used to go Saturday morning. I, I, if I went occasionally on a Saturday morning before a home game, he'd be in there, and it was almost like his tone to zone into right, get my head in the game. And uh, but he was. Always sort of said hello and nodded and whatever, but yeah, he 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 did not pump some weight. It's just so big. It's like it it just it looks like he just like eats lions for breakfast. Like, and I don't mean lion bars because obviously that wouldn't work. And um, that would make him fat probably. Um, but he just yeah, he it, I don't I'm envy him a little bit. Bit of it sounds like I've got a man crush here. I certainly don't. I've never really thought about it that deeply. But there you go. But Doesn't actually, to, to age, con- does he? No, he doesn't. No. no. But it's, uh, to contrast the kind of slightly scary outward physical side, he's got a very reserved demeanour. Um, mm-hmm. And I, th- I wonder whether that might help a young team in the playoffs, you know, that kind of level of composure. Um, obviously, you guys have talked about Robinson and players squaring up on the touchline and things like that. <laughs> Appleton, that, that doesn't often happen. It's, not, it's happened from time to time, but it doesn't often happen. And as a team, actually, we're very... We're very composed on the pitch. You won't really see us charging up to the referee, anything like that. And I, I don't know it for a fact, but I have a feeling that he's instilled that in the team. You know, maintain your composure, focus on what you can control, 
don't get caught up in any of that stuff. So, which is why I wonder whether, as you were referencing before, with the ten thousand fans at Sunderland and all that kind of stuff, might actually help us. And I think that's definitely mm-hmm. helped the young squad this season. That kind of demeanour that he's got as a manager. He's a very calm individual. You are right in that. Like all jokes aside about his giant, massive physique, um, he does seem quite a chilled out, sort of relaxed individual. When you see him on Sky and he's talking about the game, he's quite methodical uh, in the way that he speaks. Um, whereas I suppose Johnson is as well, but he's got all those David Brent words, which it's gonna it's gonna swing you one way or the another. It swung me to the shut up, mate. Um, but obviously, I, I don't want him sapped or anything like that. Far from it. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously Robinson and John. I mean, I think Ali Johnson was actually on the toilet when Carl Robinson was kicking off with whoever. Um, still don't know what actually happened. For for what it's worth, it was all just I think a headbutt slung in somewhere, but Lee Johnson was on the toilet and commented that he was, it's a good job he wasn't because he gets a little bit scrappy do, but like Lee Johnson's like five <laughs> foot two. So I don't know. I wouldn't really fancy his chances against Michael Apple and if that did kick off. Um, I want to swing back a little bit to, to sort of probably you, Sai, first and foremost. Um, I, you've touched on it already, Matt, to be fair. I don't think it's any huge secret. If Sunderland are going to win the playoffs... I'd be really surprised if Aidan McGeady hasn't got an awful lot to do with it and maybe lesser so so Charlie White based on the season he's had. Um, Last season for me, Oxford, Cameron Brannigan was standout. I know that's been not the case this season because, well, basically he almost went blind. Um, But who are Oxford's game changers? Like if you were to get the the premiership, uh, the premiership, the championship, that would be a cracking promotion, wouldn't it? Um, If you were to get the championship next, like next season via the playoffs, who are the players you think are going to be the people that are going to get you there? A, a lot will depend on on the loan players that we've had this season. Um, potentially, if we do go up, um, getting them in for next season. There is one, Marcus McGuane, who who isn't fit. He, he started the season with us, got injured. Um, he was a player that was at Arsenal when he was younger, went to Barcelona, then Forest. We yeah, had him on loan. Forest, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah, and looked great, and then got the injury, and... We always seem to leave it until like the early part of August before we sign anyone. And we ended a couple of weeks ago, we sign him on a permanent. And it's like, wow, that's quite, you know, he doesn't that. know which division we're going to be in, but he's happy, you know, he wants to come here. And and, and I think the likes of him and, and Brandon Barker, who we talked about, you know, before the game at your place, there are, we've got three or four players on loan who are, who are sort of flair players who, if regardless of which division we're in next season, if we can get those, we'll make a good go of it irrespective. I think that they're, they're, they're players who can play league one or championship quite comfortably. Um, so that will be, I think where we, where we need to perhaps strengthen and just that goal threat. But then going back to, we had a couple of games, um, crew and, and um, Shrewsbury, I think it was earlier in the season, um, where we scored 10 goals and it was 10 different goal scorers in those 10 goals. And it's, it's sort of, we can score from anywhere at the moment. And it, that's, that's going to, you know, talk about Aidan McGeady. If, if you kind of, if you can stop McGeady, I think that, that goals, you know, Sunderland quite a bit. I think we've, we've got half a dozen players who, who you've kind of will, will, will create and, and score. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's going to be, uh, you know, what, I think we we need to go go for it against Blackpool and, and hope we can get two or three goals in the first leg to to give us a chance. I think we I think you're right in what you're saying with Sunderland. And again, I think a lot of the time people think I sound very pessimistic, but that's that's honestly me. So that's all I can kind of give you. But when you look through our team, if you take away Charlie White's goals and Aidan McGee's assists, it's a little bit threadbare. It's not empty. Um, Chris Maguire obviously obviously always pops up and does something, but for some reason Lee Johnson doesn't seem to really fancy him. Um, which is baffling many of us because obviously he's a big game player and we're going into a lot of big games. Um, maybe that'll change, but outside of Maguire and probably Grant Ledbetter, who takes the penalties, to be honest, there's, there's not a great deal of players there that, that bag you that many goals. Charlie White scored 30, so it's kept us ticking over, but we're not probably different to the likes of Blackpool, Lincoln and Oxford in the sense that we don't have goals available from sort of all over the pitch, which is a little bit of a worry. Um but then again, it's it's playoffs, isn't it? So hopefully it's on my face for that. Um, Matt, I wanted to come to you regarding Blackpool. Um, you haven't conceded a goal in four games. I think a lot of people look at on paper the goal, Jerry Yates. Um, 
for obvious reasons. Um, to be fair to him, in terms of the strikers that you've got, he's not really the one that's in form. It's, it's probably Ellis Sims at the minute, if anyone, that's more in form. Um, but it's hard to look away from that defensive record. So essentially what I'm saying is across the pitch, you look pretty much in form and the games against us have been incredibly tight, but you've nicked it 1-0, which is all you need to do in these games, really. Um, if Blackpool are to go up and you know be the, the third best team in the league one, which they are, are they, if they're to go up by the playoffs, who do you expect to be the, the two or three players that are going to get you there? Um, well, I mean, yeah, Yates is 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 the obvious one, and I think the thing with Jerry is he's been crying out for rest for the last month. He has he has barely missed a minute in since sort of November because he's 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 so important to us. Um, I don't know whether we're going to play. You see, Ellie Sims is in great form, but almost our we've we've had a lot of players come back from injury in the last two, three, four weeks, and that almost worries me a little bit because it it opens more questions about how we play. Um, and we played very well against Oxford um, away. And we played one up front. We didn't play too badly against them at home. I think it was a nil-nil draw. Um, and we played Medin up front on his own. Um, and that was when we were we were really not looking good at all. Um, and it's quite difficult to work out how you can get Sims and Yates in the side and away, away from home at Oxford because we've looked with the best we've looked is when we've had five in midfield. So Keshi's only just come back. And he looks, he looks like a new signing. He looks desperate to score. He's just, he's just trying everything. He's only played two games. He's trying everything to score. Um, Sully Kai Kai would, he's my absolute, he's a total Marmite player. You know, you'll listen to Blackpool fans who say he's a waste of time. Why does he play? He goes missing. He disappears. He's hopeless. He's my favourite player we've had for years. He's just got magic in his boots. He's just, he's a genius in split seconds. But he will, but I don't know whether he's going to be fit. And even Embleton could be key because if Sully's not fit, Embleton buzzing round, just unlocking stuff. It's it's difficult to look outside the eights, to be honest, as the player. I think that you think, you know, if if we go through three two against Oxford, I'd be very surprised if you didn't say Yates with two of the goals. You know, it's funny the uh, talk about Embleton before I was reading about it because I think a few fans said, "Well, can we can we recall him?" As it was, you can't because I think you've got to add him to the squad in March and yada yada and so on and so forth and the. The deal goes to June, I think, in case you get into the playoffs and, and all that kind of stuff. But he said he'd locked Elliot Embleton in a room in the two like home and away games that we played recently. Obviously, we was playing um, quite quite recently twice. He said he'd locked him in a room, but he, he'd feel a bit unfair if he locked him in a room for four days ahead of a playoff final. So um, hopefully Elliot Embleton does have a key part to play if we do get a Wembley against you, but very much in Sunderland's favour, fingers crossed. So the, the right answer might be Elliot Embleton might be the man that makes a difference in the playoffs, but for all the wrong reasons. Um the interesting thing is it's really hard to pick our lineup. It's really, really hard to pick where our lineup will be. Um, I'm doing the Blackpool podcast in a couple of days and and it's kind of like, who's going to play fullback? Who's going to play here? Who's going to, are we two up one? And, and that's, that's the thing that slightly undermines my confidence is that, Again, we've been brilliant since Christmas. We've had horrendous injuries since Christmas. So the team's kind of picked itself. It's been 12, 13, 14 fit senior pros, right? Put them in the best positions. And there's always that worry when you've got 18 and 19 players and you start getting too clever. And they... Tom, same question to you. If we've touched on a couple of players who I fully agree with, uh, young lads that you've got on loan there. But if you are to go up, who's going to be the two or three players that is going to get you there? Oh, it's very tough. Well, I mean, it'd be easy for me to talk about experience and say Liam Bridcut, who's our club captain, but he hasn't played a great deal because struggling with Get about Bridcut. I always forget that he exists. Well, he's, he's the old man in a very, very young team. Um, he takes the average age of the squad up by a couple of years whenever he's actually in the match day squad. Um, it would also be easy to mention George Grant, our player of the season, who plays in midfield, pulls yeah. all the things, takes the set pieces. But I, 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 I wanted to bring up... Uh, forward options because I think it's interesting talking with you three guys teams that have got Charlie White Jerry Yates and even Matty Taylor through Oxford mm -hmm. you know he scored 18 this season and we play in a in a way that means that our number nine or our starting number nine Tom Hopper isn't really a goal scorer he's the link man for the wide players and he does an incredible amount of work I know Yates at Blackpool does a hell of a lot of work off the ball as well but I do wonder whether that sometimes means that his confidence in front of goal isn't as good as it should be. For example, 
three three one up against Peterborough in that game where it could have all been so different, and he missed an absolute sitter. He played in by Morgan Rogers, basically the goal to aim for, and he managed to miss. Um, and so I, that would be the only in, this the interesting point in com, in comparison with you three in that we don't have that number nine forward who scores a lot of goals. Hopper's got nine for the season. Um, and so I do wonder whether it'll come down to these young lads, Morgan Rogers and Brennan Johnson, taking their chances. They're both incredibly talented, but they're 18 and 19. And it just might come down to whether we lovely passing moves, get a chance. Do they take it or do they freeze and hit it straight at the keeper? That kind of thing. Because that, that has happened um, in lots of games this season. They score outrageous goals, but sometimes miss easier chances. Um, so it, they're, they're definitely worth a mention, as obvious it is. I do think it's very interesting in comparison to what Matt was saying. Lincoln fans have something of a dilemma at centre-half. We've, I think if you asked any Lincoln fan to pick their top two centre-backs in a back-four system, you'd get so many different answers. We've got four centre-backs who've played very well at different times all season. Joe Walsh and Adam Jackson are maybe the more experienced two. TJ Omer on, on loan from Tottenham. And Louis Monsmer, who's come from the Dutch second league and kind of blew everyone away at the start of the season. Those two have been the more recent pairing, but whether Appleton will go for a mix of experience or not, Monsmer's got a goal threat. Ioma's got great pace. As I say, Walsh and Jackson are your experienced kind of men, maybe a bit better in the air. So I do wonder, coming back to the point we were making earlier about how tight it could be, stopping Charlie White. If we don't stop McGeady's balls into the box, we then have to stop Charlie White getting on the end of them. It might come down to who Appleton picks at centre-back um, in order to keep us in these games. And then going on the counter-attack, whether uh, Brennan Johnson take, takes his chance at the other end. It's funny you go back to the game when we won 4-0 and Brennan Johnson missed two glorious chances. One of those early goes on. in. Very early yeah. on as well, wasn't it? Yeah. And that goes in. It's a different game entirely, isn't it? So it is literally in games like this, it's... It's those fine margins, isn't it? Pretty much, Absol- to be fair. Absolutely. But I just thought it was interesting, you know, listening to you guys. And obviously, side, you know, Matty Taylor's a bit of a club legend and things, but he's, you know, he's got 18 goals. I was researching for a piece this season. He obviously scored the winner against us in the 2 1 win. Um, and that's another factor in these playoff games, isn't it? Goal scorers, someone who's going to get that chance, that one chance, that one hit in the box, eight yards out on, on an angle, bang, in it goes. Um, and maybe Tom Hopper will prove me wrong, but he's not necessarily been that this season. And we've been a team who's scored some spectacular goals, but maybe at times haven't scored the balls bouncing in the box, bang, in it goes, there's your chance taken, and that's the game. Um, and I wonder whether you, all three of you guys, have got those players. So maybe, so as I say, I'm just perpetuating the underdog myth here, guys. That's all I'm doing. I'm just really, <laughs> really trying to drive it home. No chance for Lincoln. That's all I'm getting at. I think for what it's worth, when you played us at, at Bloomfield, Bridcourt really was the difference. It was a very mm. even game and Bridcourt, Bridcourt's brain yeah. was the difference. You know, we, we were really annoyed about the way we lost that game. Mm. But Bridcourt was was very good that day. And I think if he's fit again, I think that gives you a real... Yeah, definitely. We are such a young team that when he's not there... There have been so many moments where we've maybe conceded a late goal or thrown things away and you're just watching it thinking he must be sat at home throwing things at the telly or sat in the dugout going absolutely mad because he's just that player that you know takes the barge in the back when the, when the team are on the attack and wins the free kick and just goes, calm down, lads, just let's keep it, keep a bit of composure. You know, it's very telling that with the Peterborough game when we were winning, he went off at 60 minutes and we ended up drawing the game. So that, that, that says it all, really. Got a little bit of PTSD with uh, Liam Bridker because I still remember him falling over the ball when he came out right back in an 8 0 defeat at Southampton, but less of that. <laughs> less of that. Um, without giving too much analysis, Sai, just to kind of end on, I'm going to ask each one of you the same question. Um, we're all very biased and you never want to go against your own team. Um, so we'll try and take our club heads off and be totally honest with ourselves and think with our with our head and not with our heart here and if that is where you think you win the playoffs that's fine um but who wins the semi-finals and who wins the final if you were a betting man where, where are you going i without wanting to back my own team because we're all kind of wanting you know we're all doing it no 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 we, we haven't got a chance it's, it's you guys who've got a chance I, I think the the team that gets promoted is from us and blackpool i think the form that we're both in 
if you know if they get through i think that it will it will lift them um i think if we get through there's that little bit of history recently with Sunderland there's the michael appleton factor with lincoln and i, I just think i know we said earlier form doesn't come into it but i i, I kind of got that sneaking suspicion that the, the 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 team that gets promoted will come from the from our game whoever I'm, that might be i'm going with oxford i think we'll beat lincoln because that's a very sudden thing to do to give us that hope. And I think we'll do it comfortably. So we'll be like, oh, hang on a minute. Then we'll get beat off Oxford. And then Robinson and Max Power and all that stuff goes with it. Um, Tom, where are you going? Firstly for the semi-finals and then for the final. I, I agree with Sai, actually. I think the winners in in their, their game, I think, is, is a bit too much unpredictability with Lincoln and Sunderland. Um, I, I, really, I really can't call that, even either both taking my biased hat and my unbiased hat. I can't really call it between the two of us. I think it could go one of two ways. A lot of it, as I say, will depend on Michael Appleton's approach, I think. But I'll say that you'll just sneak it. I don't think it'll be comfortable, but I think you'll just sneak it. Um, but for overall, I've got to go with Blackpool. I was writing an article this week and I just found myself going back to those defensive stats. And we've, we've got so many memories, bad and good, of huge, huge goals and um, high-scoring games. But actually you could see Blackpool winning every game 1-0 and getting promotion. So that's I'll go, I'll go for Blackpool, Sunderland final, Blackpool to win it. And Matt, I'll give you the, since it's your debut, I'll give you the final say. Um, and you're probably one of the only one of all of us that's allowed to be confident about your own team, but feel free to say Sunderland, they're going to win the playoffs if you want. I'm going to torture you by giving you some optimism as a Sunderland. <laughs> it's the cruelest thing I could do. I think we'll beat Oxford because I think Oxford are... Oxford are a very good side, mm. and I think they're made to play for us to play against. You know, they're made for us to play against, and, I, and I've, I've got a confidence, which will probably turn out to be completely misplaced, and they'll win both legs 3-0. But I've got a confidence. Sunderland will beat Lincoln just. It'll be unjust, and it'll be unlucky, and everybody will be going, oh, you know, it's the, the big club in the league thing, and, and it'll happen. And... Let's be fair. The two games against us, that wasn't the that was. They're probably about our fourteenth and fifteenth best performances of the season. We didn't play particularly well against Sunderland in both games, particularly the one at the Stadium of Light. Chris Maxwell played out of his skin, you know. Oh, save at the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And defensively, we and you were you were you brought on Ross Stewart and he was pinging it at Stewart and the bouncing off him, going just wide and stuff. And and that worries me that we've used our luck up against Sunderland. It worries me that we've had our luck. I know I said I was worried about Lincoln before, but I do feel we're owed a bit of luck against Lincoln because we we really should have been 6-0 up against them before they brought it back to 2-2. You know, we we but Sunderland, we uh, I feel like like we've had our luck against Sunderland and it would it that 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 worries me slightly. So I'm going to I'm going to go for a Sunderland win in a final against us, just because it's the cruelest possible thing I could do to a Sunderland <laughs> fan. Thank you. Here's here's a final question. Actually, I didn't think of beforehand. Just a quick one word answer. Who would you prefer to play in the final side? Sunderland. Yeah, I just think that 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 whole thing with Max Power. You just, it's written, isn't it? It's kind of like that will come yeah. back and bite him on the ass. You know, you won the game you and, and he celebrated like you got promotion uh, and they'll use that. I think if it if it comes to be that it's it's the two of us in the final, you can just see our players going back to that, the management going back to that and going, there you go, that's your it, team talk. It would, be, it would be stupid not to use it, wouldn't it? So, mm. yeah, I think for me, I would prefer... Blackpool in the final, based on the reasons you've just given me before. Not because I think Blackpool are a worse side than Oxford. I actually think Blackpool is slightly better. But based on what you said, yeah, 100%. Tom, quickly from you as well, who would you prefer to play in the final, Blackpool or Oxford? For the reasons Matt has mentioned in terms of us using up our luck against Blackpool and that incredibly mean defence, I'm going to go Oxford. No offence, I si. don't think we'd beat you either. But <laughs> And Matt? Well, I'll, I'm going to go Lincoln now, which is completely opposite to what I said at the beginning. But I think it, it just illustrates just how how difficult it is to to make sense of the playoffs full stop. 
I, I said you were the favourites, but the truth is, I don't know whether there is a favourite at all. It's a very, very tight play because it's been a very, very tight league. But anyway, nonetheless, I thank you all very much for joining me for this. Uh, I wish none of you luck for very obvious reasons, and I expect the sentiments to be returned as they should. Um, to those that are listening, thanks for kind of listening to me for the entire season, or if it's the first one you've listened to, um, where have you been? Um, please like, share, subscribe, do all that kind of stuff. I forget to say that. I don't really give a shit if you don't. But it's nice if you do. If you have enjoyed it, tell us what you'd like to see next season as well, outside of Championship Football. Um, how are the lads? And see you all soon.